Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again. Believe in a power greater than what you are going through when you don't know what to do. That's right. When you don't know what to do, just keep on breathing. From the City of Angels in Los Angeles, welcome to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I am Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver at caregiverdave.com. And we're coming to you live and on demand 24-7 on numerous syndicated radio podcasts on 26 global audio and video platforms, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Speaker, SoundCloud, and a whole ton more. In fact, we're proud to be voted number one caregiver podcast of the top 50 on Player FM and number two caregiver podcast on Feedspot out of the top 60 and number two on CaringVillage.com. And we have an especially exciting show planned for you today, Samantha Palais. It almost sounds French. <laughs> uh, change your cooking, change your life. Samantha Palais overcame physical limitations from birth and smash the glass ceiling to become South Australia's first female urological surgeon. Wow. Solopreneur, two-time Amazon bestseller, all as a single mom. That would make her Wonder Woman. <laughs> she advocates for work-life balance and healthy living. Samantha was one of four finalist nominees for SA Australia of the year 2022. What does SA stand for? South Australia. So there's a state, there's a state sort of finalist. A state. Well, I got that. Before we get started, I want to take this moment and thank my last week's guest, Susan Lax. She earned a degree teaching a, in creative drama from the Kibbutz College of Education, Technology, and the Arts in Israel. Great show. Just a reminder, you can watch or listen to that interview and all our interviews, including this one on our membership website, caregiverdave.com or any of our other 26 global networks that I mentioned earlier. All right, enough of that. Samantha, welcome to the Caregiver Dave Show. We're so excited to have you on. Thanks, Dave. I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> I love your Australian accent because I imitate Australia. I say, today, Mike, when people come into my gas station and they laugh. Anyway, <laughs> I'll try not to do that to you because they probably think that my uh, imitation of them sucks. Anyway, I want to ask uh, you the very first question. I ask all my guests, who is Samantha Pillay and why was she placed on this earth? <laughs> I mean, isn't that, a, that's what we spend our whole lifetime uh, finding out. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a surgeon specializing in urology and I subspecialize in incontinence surgery and I'm located in <clears throat> Adelaide, which is the uh, capital city of the South state of South Australia. Cool. And I... Uh, what have I been, um, who am I? I'm here, I'm, I'm passionate about helping people. I'm addicted to helping people. And <laughs> that drives me for everything that I do. And in actual fact, I'm sure that many caregivers, that is really the key of who they are. It's that passion to want to put others before themselves and really help people. And I have been very privileged to be able to do that as a surgeon and even more so privileged <clears throat> to be able to find other ways uh, outside of the operating theatre to reach people and help people. And I suppose that's the beauty of the writing the books and being able to uh, speak and advocate for a number of different issues to widen that reach of the people that I'm able to help through my words, not just through the scalpel. Mm. So we'll talk about your books uh, as we go on, but what are the names of your two books? So the first two books that Amazon bestsellers, the first was the No Recipe Cookbook, which might seem a little bit strange for surgeons, <laughs> and the second was the first in a picture book series that I'm writing wow. to inspire <clears throat> the next generation of female leaders in um, and break career gender stereotypes so that it's all a little girl. And the first book is When I'm a Surgeon. The second book, uh, which is also out, uh, which is When I'm an Entrepreneur, and the third book, which... Uh, should be available. Um, well, it's probably going to be available in about six weeks for pre-order if anyone wants to join my mailing list and by August um, published when I'm an astronaut. 
So this is a series of picture books for oh. very young girls. See, we have something in common. We both just launched a new book. Mine is uh, Wisdom from the Hammock, Uncommon... S- no, I'm sorry. Secrets from the Hammock, Uncommon Wisdom for Uncommon Times. It's like changing the title a hundred different times before you finally get the title. <laughs> it's not infirmly implanted in my memory. I'll read your book. You read mine. How's that? That sounds, mine won't take long. As I say, it's a children's picture book, so it might take you about a minute. <laughs> well, mine won't take long either. You can do it in one reading. Um, when you say urologist, I immediately think, because I'm 68 years old and I know I see a urologist <laughs> because, you know, men, when they get a little older, have trouble uh, urinating and, you know, the prostate gets a little big and it starts pushing on things. Is that any different from uh, the urologist uh, you said incontinence? That's right. Well, that is absolutely no difference. And it just is an example of how uh, stereotypes can sometimes limit people's vision. So male health and prostate, prostate cancer uh, and non-prostate cancer, uh, uh, prostate disease are probably what a lot of people identify with urologists, but there is other areas of urology, you know, and stones is another area that people yes. uh, associate. But I had, I had a stone one time. I felt like I was giving birth. They said yeah. I need to drink more water. <laughs> well, there's other consequences of giving birth and not just from giving birth, many causes of urinary incontinence, and it affects a huge proportion of the population, uh, about a quarter in Australia. So, one in three women who've had a baby have urinary incontinence and it's a big mm. reasons for people for not be able to self-care. It's one of the top three reasons for people to be admitted to residential age care and managing uh, incontinence or not being able to manage incontinence is another reason why people need care. So I have sub-specialised in probably a less well-known area of uh, urology and advocated in my career over the last 20 years for ending the stigma of urinary incontinence and the treatment of it, uh, just as my first book, When I'm a Surgeon, breaks some of the stereotypes around surgeon. Often people just think of a surgeon as someone who sees patients, operates in theatre, but there's many facets that surgeons can pursue, whether it be a military career or a research career, uh, public speaking, teaching, and a lot mm-hmm. more, say, beyond what people just first thoughts of what a surgeon actually is. So is continence considered urinary urinary only or bowel as well? It is bowel as well. Uh, That is not as common, but obviously incredibly debilitating. Although there is crossover um, in sort of the early management of, um, say, bowel incontinence, that isn't something that comes under the subspecialty of urology. It would usually be treated by... Um, colorectal surgeons here in Australia right, and gastroenterologists. And so uh, is that something that the population should be concerned about, that one day they may be incontinent? What percentage of the population does it affect? So if you look at women over the age of 50, 50, uh, which is where I am, uh, Mm -hmm. it's more than 50%. And men or... Uh, and men, men have just as many bladder issues, but less likely to actually get to the point of urinary incontinence. So the, the it is uh, put, uh, something that does affect women a lot more often, um, and once uh, and it does increase with age. But if we look at young women, uh, say sort of sixteen to thirty, that have never had a child, we're still looking at about sixteen percent have urinary incontinence. So it's really oh. common, more common, say, than diabetes, hypertension, asthma, uh, depression, cancer, and yet doesn't seem to get anywhere near the coverage. Uh, there's a certain amount of embarrassment. Many people oh. don't come forward uh, right. and don't really appreciate maybe how much it's impacting on their life, their relationships, their mental health, restricting their activities, their productivity, or even their work. Yeah, you know, well, my wife had a stroke when she was 52. That was 25 years ago. And she has not had any incontinence problems. But lately, um, you know, when she has to go to the bathroom, sometimes it leaks out and she was trying the little pads, but that didn't work. I talked her into wearing the uh, the adult diapers and she was very, you know, uh, resistant to that because of the stigma again. Oh, no, I uh, 
But finally, after a couple of times of wedding herself, uh, she gladly wears them now. But is she have any chance of eventually becoming incontinent? I mean, are these the warning signs? What so are the warning she signs? Is, Let me ask you so that. So she is already incontinent. Incontinent means really? any involuntary loss of urine at, mm. in the toilet. So if you have wet underpants or you wear a pad and you leak urine before you get to a woman sit on the toilet seat, <laughs> you have urinary incontinence. It's just the question is how often does that urinary incontinence occur and how large are the leaks? But she is suffering from urinary incontinence. It's not losing the lot. So, um, yes, she has urinary incontinence. Someone yeah. might have experienced only one episode in their life. Mostly when her bladder is full and she really has to go. But, I mean, we're all kind of like that, aren't we? Even little kids. No, not at all. <laughs> um, uh, so that's right. There are treatments available. Okay. And like what? what often happens is so the symptoms of urgency and rushing to the toilet, what we call overactive bladder, mm. uh, and that's one of the commonest uh, causes of urinary incontinence as well as what we call stress incontinence, which is more relating to exertion. Yeah. But this sort of urge, key in the door, um, which is often some associated with it or once people are on their way to the toilet, urinary leakage of frequency, yeah. getting up at night, all part of what we call overactive bladder mm. symptoms. And they... That there are treatments available for that, um, and medication. That tip, sorry. Medication. Yeah, there's medication. Um, so the non-surgical treatments there can be bladder training, pelvic floor exercises, bowel management, dietary modification, avoiding caffeine, medical therapy. There's a number of different medications that act on the bladder to improve bladder control. And then for patients failing that, there are other treatments we use: botulinum toxin or Botox, as it's often called, injected into the bladder is a, is a very common treatment or even a neuromodulation where we use electrical devices to stimulate the nerves to the bladder to achieve bladder control. And these devices can be implanted into the body, mm. a bit like a you, pacemaker. She drinks a lot of Diet Coke, at least one a day. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> but she's not giving it up. <laughs> I'll that, ask uh, her. That's really interesting. So... Health prevention, you know, 80% of chronic diseases, so heart disease, diabetes, stroke are preventable. 40% of cancers are preventable. Um, and that's one of my other big areas of passion and something I do public speaking on and write articles on my website relating to chronic preventable disease. A lot of people know, they know what facts are now. We've got the science, we've got the research, but they just struggle to be able to prioritise and consistently make the changes to improve their health. And I'm motivated to try and help people do that because I realised as a surgeon, what I can do to help someone is insignificant compared to what they could actually do to help themselves hmm. and trying to help people make those changes. Well, let's talk about your, your change to cooking. T tell me about that. Why, why and uh, how is it working out? So that came about, so I had congenital hip dysplasia, which meant I failed to walk as a child. I started school in a wheelchair, had multiple operations, and I spent my life with very restricted mobility and 24-hour pain. And just getting through life was an issue. I had to prioritise my own health um, to keep my weight under control when I couldn't exercise because every kilo just reduced my mobility, exacerbated my body exacerbated my pain and was like a exponential sort of snowball effect. So I had to really work hard, put in a lot of hours. I, I felt like I had one path I could take in life, which was going to be, you know, almost an inability to work and disability um, benefits versus a full-time job looking after myself to mean that I could front up and participate in the workforce just like someone else who didn't have my problems. And that was a full-time job and commitment. But being able to work was one thing, but beyond that, uh, I struggled because all my energy, all the steps in my day, um, all my income uh, uh, and spare time seemed to be consumed on looking after myself. My biggest stress wasn't, you know, being a surgeon, it was what's for dinner. I was, <laughs> it got, as my mobility deteriorated before my hip replacement, which I put off for many years, partly because um, that wasn't advised in my mm. 20s, which was more than 30 years ago because of the success of the surgery at that age. I got to the point where I couldn't even do my supermarket shopping. You know, there's no way I could have oh. parked the car and even got to the first aisle. And so I'd have to really plan and get someone to go and do my shopping for me once a week. 
Um, I'd have someone maybe cook a couple of days, yeah. but, you know, it, if, if I unpack the car, the groceries, I wouldn't have the energy to cook. If I cooked a meal, I couldn't stand to wash up. And um, so I'd have to cook, I'd have to really plan, almost cook two nights meals and eat the next day. And that just grew over the years through my pain management. Mm. Um, but also as a single mom and running a business and working as a surgeon, you know, time was, I was pretty yeah. time poor as well. I learned how to shop once a fortnight, cooking the sort of uh, maybe low shelf, short shelf, shelf life food early on, long shelf life food at the end of the cycle, plan my meals and do sort of slow cooks and freeze. And I really changed my cooking and changed my life. I stopped trying to follow recipes um, because I was almost mentally, I was mentally uh, exhausted just trying to work out what to cook. So if I could just go and shop, didn't need to follow a recipe. I had a basic re repertoire of meals. I think cooking shows and celebrity chef just Kate creates kitchen phobes and lead us to believe it's harder than it needs to be <laughs> and I changed my cooking and changed my life I was able to reduce my stress I had more time I could plan my meals and then I had other spin-offs it more than halved my shopping end um uh, and it uh reduced my food waste Wow. Uh, so there were huge benefits and I thought, you know, I'm not the only person that wants to save time, save money. I lost weight because there's so much um, hidden calories, sure. saturated fats and sugar. And I thought, you know, I'm not the only person who's trying to eat healthy, wants to lose weight, avoid processed foods, calories, uh, save money, save time. And that led to the no recipe. Well, what do you think about those things I see on television there advertising? Just call us up and subscribe to this and we'll send you the, the meal. It's already uh, prepared. You just pop it in the oven or whatever. You've heard about those? I, yes, we have various versions. Wouldn't that save time? It, it, well, I don't think it does save time. Um, and I definitely don't think it saves money. You don't have the it's bulk expensive. purchase. Yeah. So, you know, if you go to the supermarket, you might see, oh, carrots are, you know, a bag of carrots is on special this week, you know, for a kilo. And you can just adjust what you're cooking to what's available and what's on special. Mm -hmm. You know, you can buy a whole cabbage or a whole broccoli. <laughs> I mean, we're not, we're not talking bulk, bulk buying. We're just talking that sort of buying power. Whereas sometimes those meal preps, you just get even a portion, which is for the one meal. Whereas, you know, there's a way to cook and um have you know you might make three nights meal depending on what it is yeah. some things will lend itself to freezing some things don't lend itself to freezing like you know even a stir fry or something like that but once i got over this sort of mental what i should be doing and what i could be doing difference even things like that i could make a, a stir fry and have it two nights in a row you know have leftovers the next night i would not sort of meal i'd freeze but when you're really struggling um, you know, that's okay. Uh, I, 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 it was good enough for me um, and my son. Yeah, this is great for surgeons and caregivers because they, they rarely have time and there's so much on their plate, figuratively speaking, pardon the pun. Um, so let's see now. Um, so one of the things I should mention is that if people are interested on my website, there's four of the meals that people can just download for free as chapters from the book if they're just interested and would like to experiment. It's really written for people who don't cook. So there's no pictures, no mm. recipes. It's written in prose. And then you can follow the methods and adjust the ingredients to suit your taste supply. We're getting supply disruptions as well as inflation in Australia, mm. and I'm sure you have there. Um, and so that's just samanthapillay.com. Yes. So um, do you actually, when you're preparing your meal, do three or four of them and freeze the rest for maybe the following week or something like that? Do you do that? Exactly. And as I say, it will depend. There's some things like a stew or slow cook right. or a curry. Or, Hard to um, freeze lettuce. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That will work. Um, and then other things that you might, you know, or soups, then there's other things that you, you might make a sort of meat based or yeah. something and then use that as a, a fresh vegetable add to it you might add the veggies you know and, and stuff so you've already got the meal partly prepared but then some foods like a risotto even or something that you wouldn't freeze I can cook and we can have it two nights in a row 
Yeah. Um, but, you know, I have the same thing for breakfast every day. I often will eat the same thing for lunch. And I would always give, had this <sighs> mindset that I had to be different every night. Um, but when you're really struggling to, to kind of with time, um, you know, it doesn't have to be. I might not have it four nights in a row, but two nights sure. is fine. Are you cooking for yourself only? No, I, I've got a teenager. Oh, are they a teenage panicky? boy? So, <laughs> so I think that's cooking for three, isn't that? Me and a teenage boy. Sure, sure. And they're not picky about what they eat. No, uh, they'll eat anything. That, huh? Boys will eat anything, I think. Yes, and I think that's just you know I didn't have a lot of choices um, as a single mum. You know, I had to have, I had to parent so that my son could eat everything. There was no way I could be doing dealing with it. You know, necessity creates the mother of invention, isn't right. it? Um, you know, he was well behaved. He didn't run away from me when he was small. I had to parent well uh, because if he ran away, I couldn't run after him. Right. So uh, do you go to, you know, the uh, Sam's Clubs or the Costco's and, and buy in bulk? I go to, we have an Audi very near us. Do you, is that one of the chains that you have over there? No, Audi, huh? Yeah, it's a European chain, but it's a budget discount Um Bulk? place that gets so they don't have the full range of stuff they just have what they can get in bulk and cheap i'm I sure see. it's similar so you really save money doing that huh i can save money i got i wasn't i mean i'm lucky as a surgeon that wasn't my biggest right. driver it actually all started but who doesn't want to save money sure. um because there's Especially always something you can, <laughs> there's always something else you can spend it on but i more than half my weekly groceries um without even trying to buy, you know, the, 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 the discount brand that you can get in supermarkets by just going right. to um, those supermarkets and buying in bulk, buying in what's in season. And that's the beauty of having the repertoire of knowing I know how to cook um, yeah. a stir fry. We have a lot of vegetable dishes as well, sometimes with tofu or lentils or beans. Um, especially now we have had big escalations in meat prices in Australia. I don't know what it's like there. Really? Um, not, yet. <laughs> not yet. So do you, you have freezers to put the extra bulk, you know, because if you buy, you know, extra this or that, you got to store it somewhere, right? Either in the cupboard or, or in a freezer somewhere. Do you have a, a second refrigerator or a second freezer? I do not. I do not. So the you can pack things really well. I do have a vacuum pack sealer thing, you oh. know, where you put, that and helps. you can pack things quite well in those sorts of um, plastic packets that they'll pack mm -hmm. well into a freezer. The, the other thing is I might have um, three sort of different meals at a time in the freezer. And then obviously I'm um, with, the, with the No Recipe Cookbook, I can ease, I'll have a lot of meals I'm still cooking. So I'm still cooking yeah. maybe four nights a week and then going to a freezer, you know, one or two nights yeah. a week. When I, because I, shop i mean that was a huge time saver and obviously anyone who's got physical limitations yeah shopping once a fortnight i actually can shop once every or well, fortnight is every two weeks sorry in australia um i can actually shop once every three weeks so there there are those um and use the freezer meals and the long life ingredients say cooking with root vegetables or you know um uh dried beans and lentils that i can soak and use in that third week so there's the different what i choose to cook will vary on the shelf life yeah so uh a lot of caregivers you know cooking isn't their forte they can't even boil water and so they'll eat a lot of junk or go to fast food what what do you say to the person who who's oh no no i can't cook i can't follow a recipe so how is your book different so as i said there's no pictures no recipes it talks mm -hmm. through the process I mean, there is even, it goes from really some really basics like scrambled eggs, mm. how to make really good scrambled eggs, um, which can be an easy meal. You know, sometimes something happens and mm. we just get home late. And that's how this sort of started. I was actually, I'd had decision fatigue from the end, at the end of the day because I'm so busy. I'd be hangry and just ordering a meal delivery actually takes time and energy you know i'd look at an app it take i can cook a meal now longer than i can kind of make a decision and wait for a meal so it is written for kitchen phobes and having a basic repertoire of uh, a few meals it, so you can un it explains an understanding of how the food cooks how to use one pan 
So I had to minimise washing up, how to add the ingredients or cut them into different sizes based on their cooking times and add them to the one pan. And it is for people who don't cook. It is, it is not a book for cooks. Um, well, as I say, I do know some people who found a lot of value because it, they still have times where they need to, to save time. It's, I call it the anti-fancy cooking movement. <laughs> um, you know, people have been feeding themselves for uh, thousands and thousands of years. We've somehow tried to make it complicated. And if you've got health problems and cooking is hard, the last thing you need to be doing is going to process foods and high-calorie foods with saturated fats. The amount of sugar or salt especially that is in um, shop, restaurant meals, you know, um, uh, the majority of people are having way too much salt. I think a third of people in the US have got high blood pressure um, and the salt in these sources and restaurant, the majority comes from restaurant and takeout meals. There's more oh. salt, um, I think the CDC said, in a restaurant meal than, ta- than fast food. Wow, that's interesting. So um, where can people get your book? All the usual online re- retailers, so Amazon and the like. There's links, again, on my webpage to those providers, but most of the, the um, online sellers have the No Recipe Cookbook in either paperback or ebook. So if somebody doesn't even, has never even scrambled an egg, would you walk them through it and how to teach Correct. them how to scramble an egg? So no yes. pictures, right? No pictures or diagrams. Correct. You're just describing it. That is correct. All right. Well, hey, it's, a, it's an amazing concept that a surgeon would write a cookbook. <laughs> what kind of feedback have you gotten from the book? Or has, isn't it out yet? No, no, it's out. I've had great feedback, in fact, um, and a lot of interviews in the U.S., the because there is a lot out there for people who have the time and energy and skills and like cooking and are interested in cooking. There's so many cookbooks and cooking shows. But this is people who just need to eat. You know, they don't um, – the cooking shows do not help someone who just needs food on the table. Yeah. And having that way of being able to save time, save money, have a basic go-to, I um, haven't – you know, I, I started using these sorts, this repertoire that I had developed of, uh-huh. you know, basic go-to meals that I could just recycle over, you know, a three or four week cycle. And for two years now, I haven't used another cookbook. Wow. I live and eat the No Recipe Cookbook. That's all we survive on. And you eat the same breakfast every single day, right? You don't get tired of that? No, I don't because I'm so busy. I mean, a lot of... Um, what is your and breakfast? Give us your typical breakfast. My typical breakfast is oats. And then I have a, a mix. And that this is actually in the No Recipe Cookbook of things that I put on it based on, you know, health. So goji berries, linseed, sunflower seeds. What kind um, of milk do you use? I just use normal cow's milk. Oh. I have a um, low-fat and I'll and some Greek yogurt. Um, oh, that's nice. And you don't because object of the lower to sugar oat, salt. Milk, oat milk, soy milk, uh, cashew. There's so many different kinds of milk out. Coconut milk, anything goes. Anything goes. Uh, a woman of my age needs the calcium, so I, I got to make sure that it's got calcium. All right. Well, how can people uh, write you if they have some questions that they want to ask you about your book or something like that? How do they contact you? So there's a contact page on my website, samanthapillay.com. It's also got the links to social media pa- platforms where people connect through um, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Just a reminder, uh, you can listen to this show on my website, caregiverdave.com or any of our other 26 global platforms. And let me just tell you, go to caregiverdave.com. It's a free membership website with lots of tools, resources, free gifts. Check out my page. And we have 34,000 followers. And if you uh, click the like or follow button on whatever platform you're watching or listening to this interview on, it helps us reach even more caregivers by improving Google's search engine algorithm. So thank you again, all my listeners out there all over the world for tuning in every Wednesday, making us the number one caregiver podcast on the internet. So until next week, same time, same channel, may God richly bless you all. Bye-bye, and thank you, Samantha. 
Thanks, Dave. Dave Nassani, the caregiver's caregiver, has just released his sixth book entitled It's My Life Too, Thrive to Stay Alive as a Caregiver. It was specifically written for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but just don't know how. Dave is the sole caregiver to his wife, Charlene, since 1996. He knows firsthand what caregivers are going through because he is one. He now speaks all across the country, offering caregivers his amazing caregiver support package. Even the airlines tell us that in the event of an emergency, to put your oxygen mask on first before you help your child with their mask. They know that those who don't heed their advice often black out, thus becoming unable to help either themselves or their child. And caregivers are exactly the same way. It's my life too. Thrive and stay alive as a caregiver will help caregivers who are neglecting their sleep, diet, and social life and learn to put their needs first. Pick up your copy today or buy one for your special caregiver on sale everywhere and at caregiverdave.com. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again. Keep breathing, take it in and let it out. Keep breathing, it's gonna be okay. Dave Nassani, the caregiver's caregiver, has just released his sixth book entitled It's My Life Too, Thrive to Stay Alive as a Caregiver. It was specifically written for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but just don't know how. Dave is the sole caregiver to his wife, Charlene, since 1996. He knows firsthand what caregivers are going through because he is one. He now speaks all across the country, offering caregivers his amazing caregiver support package. Even the airlines tell us that in the event of an emergency, to put your oxygen mask on first before you help your child with their mask. They know that those who don't heed their advice often black out, thus becoming unable to help either themselves or their child. And caregivers are exactly the same way. It's my life too. Thrive and stay alive as a caregiver will help caregivers who are neglecting their sleep, diet, and social life and learn to put their needs first Pick up your copy today or buy one for your special caregiver on sale everywhere and at caregiverdave.com.